Excellent. I can hear the sounds and that means that we are ready to come back to Virtual Jug 24, the 24 hours Java conference uh, powered by Virtual Jug, which is the online only Java user group, which anyone can join uh, all across the world. And we are continuing our epic journey here. I think we are right at the middle. I hope so. Um, I Honestly, I hope that we are way uh, over the middle, but it doesn't seem so. So let me just share my screen and give a couple of uh, words about the session that's coming up in our sponsors. So we will be seeing the Polishing the Diamond, the Core Library Improvements in Java 9 session by Richard Warburton and Raul Gabriel Urma. And obviously such a must massive uh, undertaking as the VJ24 wouldn't be able uh, to exist without the generous help of the sponsors uh, and uh, participation and help of the local jugs all over the world. So the sponsor for this session is Zero Turnaround, which is the producer company produces, producing tools for Java developers. So for this session, uh, they will be really happy if you take a look and check out a tool called Extrable Local, which is a performance-oriented tool. And you can done for developers, so you can instrument your Java web application and get the insight about uh, performance bugs right in development where you fix them quite cheaply. Uh, if we talk about the organizational details about how the sessions are organized, if you just joined us currently watching on YouTube, uh, then check out the vjug 24com website where you will find the YouTube widget for the video and you will also find the link to the Slack group uh, where you can join the live session channel. And in that channel, we discuss the contents of the session. You can ask questions that we will forward to the speakers and, and uh, it's a lovely community in there. So be sure to do that. If you are on the social media, the official hashtag of the conference is VJOC24. So be sure, be sure to share uh, what you learn and uh, we'll be happy to see uh, some noise in the Twitter sphere. And if you're just joining the video, then be sure to use the YouTube cog icon to raise the quality of the broadcast up to the maximum that uh, your connection supports. It should be HD that will improve the quality of the session tremendously because all the code snippets will be actually readable then uh, and they might not be readable otherwise. So thanks to the sponsors. Uh, those are the organizational details. All the questions could be asked in the Slack or in Twitter. Uh, and without further ado, let's go and meet our participants for this session. Uh, so with us is Dutch Java user group, NL Jock. Hey, people. Uh, it's lovely to see you here. Yeah, yeah, well, there was also a little problem in the Netherlands and Rotterdam, there were uh, big uh, traffic jams. So uh, some people are turning around and are going back and are watching um, it on the, on, on the mainstream. So, well, we are now with two people, but you also see that there, but that man is also, uh, is also live and kicking in the, in, in the show on the, on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, excellent. Well, it's it's great that at least you guys could join us live. Uh, hope you enjoyed the session. If you have any questions, uh, ask uh, Raul and uh, Richard as well. And let's, without further ado, let's go and meet our speakers. So let's go in the direction of how the names were spelled on the title slide. Uh, welcome, Richard Warburton, to the VJAC24. Hello, how's it going? Yeah, it's, it's going pretty, pretty good, but it's been a long journey so far. So, uh, <laughs> How tired uh, are you at this moment in time? It's actually not that bad. It's just 9 p.m., uh, but there is like still, it all started at 10 a.m. my time. So uh, there is a lot of, oh boy, more than half to go, but we'll manage. Uh, we have shifts, we have people, we are a big community, and we are ready here for an excellent session. So. Everyone say, well, you cannot say, but cheer for Richard and he is right there. So the second speaker here, we have Raul Gabriel Urma. Raul, how are you doing? Hey, how's it going? Good to see that you're looking fresh and uh, 
I think, given we've reached the middle, you must be an absolute Java expert by now, given you've listened to all the talks. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot take that much information at once, but uh, I'm here to moderate the session. So if uh, I can make sure which screen of you guys will be shown to the stream. So if you want to switch the screens between you two, just tell that, and I will try to switch that in a second. Uh, and uh, if any, if the audience has any questions, you can. They will ask through me, and if you have any questions to the audience, I will try to uh, ask them. And this Google Hangouts is with ultra low delay, so actually the stream is just literally like less than a second away from what is happening now. So uh, it could be pretty interactive. Just uh, this a note because I know you've given a double session for the VJUG before. And it was a little bit different. So without further ado, I, I hope you have the proper introductions uh, because I'm out of introduction time. And uh, Java 9 core improvements. Go, go, go. The stage is yours. Thanks, Oleg. Thank you very much, you Oleg. That's, that's great. Yeah, uh, I'm going to just uh, kick off uh, by sharing my screen here. Uh, so um, for anyone listening at home, Raul and I uh, run a training company called iteratorlearning.com. And if you want any of the source code for the things we're going to be talking about in this session, or if you want to refer to it afterwards, you can just go to our website, iteratorlearning.com, click on the bit that says Java articles at the top, and then all the articles are here, and there's a variety of source code that you can see for the things we're going to be talking about and refer to. But for the actual presentation that we're going to be doing, we're not really going to be using uh, slides, are we, Raoul? No, I think uh, slides are so has been. It's for the past, Richard. Let's bring back the cool black and white shell. Programming 70s style. That's what we're about. Um, so, what have we got here, Raoul? What's the J shell term that I've got sitting in my terminal? Well, Richard, it sounds pretty fancy, but it's got a J uh, in front of it. So, I presume it's extra cool is it a java shell exactly shipped with uh, java 9 is the j shell tool the java shell and it allows you to execute java line after line as you would see in any console or with something like ipython say i don't so, believe you can, can you do maths? Well, uh, well we can so we can do something like one plus two and the answer is three obviously Amazing. Um, amazing, exactly. One plus two is three. Uh, but you can basically evaluate arbitrary Java expressions. So if we just say uh, system out printland, uh, hello world, we get hello world printed out as well. So we can we can take you know an arbitrary Java expression or an arbitrary Java statement, and uh, we can get it running on our uh, on our terminal. That's, it's fantastic. That's great. Right? So it's it's shipped in uh, in Java nine, which is released by now, and it's a great way you're saying to kind of interactively learn and try different code snippets and get a feel for for what's going on. Exactly, and in fact, what we're going to do in this talk is we are going to uh, use the uh, J shell tool in order to uh, look at a bunch of different Java nine core library updates. So that's why we called this talk "Polishing the Diamond" because Java already a diamond, but a bit of a diamond in the rough. There's lots of little situations where you might have uh, problems or things aren't as strong as they could be, and Java 9 helps to improve them. So we're going to be looking, first of all, at collection factory methods. Then we're going to have a look at some stream improvements. Then we're talking about collector improvements. Then we're going to talk about the optional API that was introduced in Java 8. Okay. Fantastic. How so does that sound to you, mate? Let's uh, let's get started, Richard. I want to see some code, you know? Absolutely. So what's the thing with Java that you hate the most? Uh, it's so verbose. Like, I have to write so much code for very simple things. You know, it's it's really great when, when you're paid by lines of code. Um, you know, even something like just creating a little array list with different values. It takes so many lines. For each value, I have to add another statement to to add so that's really the buzz you know in, in python richard it's way simpler way better 
Yeah. So as you were talking, it took all that time that you were talking for me to just write hello world from Java in the terminal here. And you can get it nicely printed out here. And some other languages, as you say, will let us just write syntax like that, won't they? And easily, easily uh, initialize a list. Now, in Java before Java 9, they added this little arrays as list. I think it's way back in Java 5 or something like that. Um, and that is quite a useful snippet of code, right? We've got our values list here with hello world from Java. Uh, and it's instantiated. It's a little bit more uh, succinct. What do you think about that, Raul? What's your thoughts on arrays as list? I think it's um, it's an improvement. It's definitely uh, neater to to write down in comparison to your first approach. But um, I've got a little question. What what's actually returned here? Uh, what's assigned to to values? It's clearly a subtype of list. But um, is it just it's normal array list? Yeah, it, it it is a list. Uh, but if we get its class, we can see it's arrays dollar array list. So it's a kind of a weird array list. So for example. Uh, what it's really doing is it's a list that wraps up an array. So you can modify the elements, but you can't extend it. So, for example, if I try and add PHP at the end. You love PHP. I hate PHP. It tells me unsupported operation exception. Now, that's a good thing, right? We don't want dirty PHP getting into our uh, list of values here. But, but um, yeah, go ahead. R R Richard, you know, PHP... It's one of those programming languages that's really sneaky. You know, it really comes in your face when you least expect it. So what about using uh, the method set, for example, instead? Yeah. What if we do that? We modify the values. And now, dun, 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 it says, hello, world from PHP. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, VJug24 listeners. I hope I've not offended you. I hope you're not clicking away from the terminal. Don't worry. This pro this This talk is not about PHP, it's about Java. Let's get that off our screens. So, R Richard, I mean, come on. Surely there must be one way in Java to succinctly create a, a list that is immutable. Is that possible? Well, it is in Java 9, you see. So in Java 9, we can say, look, the list of, so all the, the, the collection interfaces, list, set, map, things like that, they've had these of methods that have been passed in that take a var args parameter and construct an immutable list of values from that parameter. So for example, here, yeah, if we try and add PHP, it'll fail. And if we try and set PHP, in there, it will also fail. So we are, we are safe from the PHP demons. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, but w what about sets? Is it Does it just work for list? Yeah, that's a great question. So we can also do uh, a set construction here uh, and uh, build up our hello world. And as we can see from the print line, you know, sets uh, in this case don't have a defined order that they might be encountered in. So, you know, we started off with hello world, and we've got world hello when we get it to set. It works. So, Richard, also uh, immutable. Ah, oh, fantastic. Well, I, I've got a, another question for you. Um, sorry to, to bother you with all these questions, but... Um, hey, no problem, man. Why, why can't we just have that syntax? You know, square bracket, world, comma, hello. Like, Python has it. Why, why can't right. Java not have it? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of overhead in changing languages. Um, there's a lot of cost involved, and it's a bit of an economic trade-off, as far as I can tell. Um, the main issue here is you have that kind of syntax, and uh, there's lots of different options you go with syntactically, and there's also a lot of different things like should you have initialized a syntax for say JSON objects or XML things like that, which look a little bit like a collection but aren't really a collection. Um, okay, all sorts of different choices. Well, that's that's a great point. And and since you've mentioned uh, JSON, what about data structures of, of a key value pairs? For example, maps in in Java. Do, do, does your trick work for maps as well? Yeah, sure. Um, you're from Brussels. I am. How many people live in Brussels? Uh, I think it's around one million one hundred thirty-nine thousand. Something like that. Sounds good. Uh, and I was born in Cardiff. Oh, I'm actually going to Cardiff, uh, Cardiff for the is a much conference uh, this week. Lovely city. 
uh, and it has 341,000. What we've got here is a uh, map from whoops, to daisies, string to integer, uh, where the strings are the names of our cities and the integers are the number of people there. So Brussels, big city, Cardiff, smaller city, uh, and we can see that map lookup. And in fact, if we look at that map dot of construct, there are different overloads that take pair combinations of key value pairs here. But the problem with that construct is you can't really do an arbitrary length map dot of having key value pairs in a type safe way. Java has var args, but if you've got a var args argument, you've got to have them, you can only have one, it's got to be at the end of the parameter list, and all the elements in your var args have to be the same type. So map has long had this entry interface as part of it that, that represents a pair within a map. And there's actually been a method which I've statically imported from the map interface here called entry. Okay, so entry will let me instantiate an entry here. I've, I might have accidentally uh, got rid of a million people there. Let's, let's fix that. Um, and what we can actually do here is also hey, use them. Richard, don't get rid right. of uh, us Belgians. There, there isn't many of us anyway, so please be nice to us. I, I don't actually want to get rid of any Belgians whatsoever. I love Belgians. Well, a beer at least. Um, and so you can instantiate the of entry, the map dot entry of entries constructor, and you can have as many cities as you want in there. But for our example, we've only got two. Fantastic. So how do you feel? I mean, it's Java less verbose. Uh, definitely le less verbose when it comes to uh, creating uh, the collections. And the, the style that you're showing me here is definitely a bit more declarative. It's immediately understandable what are the different parts that we're trying to to instantiate and create. So that's definitely a, a thumbs up, Richard. Definitely a thumbs up. Awesome. So let's. Uh see what else we have in our table of contents for this talk. We've talked about collection factory methods. Let's talk about streams, because there were a few streams improvements in Java 9 as well, weren't there? The, 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 there are quite a few improvements. And uh, I, I don't know about you, Richard, but streams is definitely one of my favorite uh, updates that was introduced in Java 8. It's a great way to kind of declaratively uh, process data. In a, in a way that's a bit more readable and more functional. So definitely love it. And it's great to, to hear that there's some couple of goodies that were added. So what's the first one? Absolutely. So the first one is the addition of an of nullable factory method. So if we've got a little stream here uh, that we're going to have with, say, we've got a couple of different properties. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a customizable home directory for our application, which we'll call app home. And then if we can't, if it's not set on the command line for our application, we're just gonna back off to the user's home directory, user.home. So we're gonna have a couple of stream values there. And what I wanna do is for each of those stream values, I wanna look up the setting. So I'm gonna say, take each of those values and flat map its name. And we're going to look up the value using the system.get property method. And you're going to have to name. deal with uh, the case where the, uh, it's null or not null. Exactly. So if value is null, so that's the case where there is no property, what we'll return is an empty stream. Is an empty stream using the empty factory method. And flat map, what it's going to do is it's going to flatten together all these streams that we return. And then finally, you have to return another stream that contains that element. And th that's why you make use of flat map here, because if it's empty, then it'll be ignored. And if there's a stream with one element, fantastic, it'll be selected because flat map will flatten those streams. Fantastic. Absolutely. So as you say, it flattens those streams together and lazily evaluates these things. And so the first thing that, we, that, that has a property, we return. Richard, um, Richard which in this case is my home directory slash home slash Richard. Um, okay. Um, what just, do you feel about this code, Raoul? What's your, what's your um, instinct? Uh, you know, Richard, if, if I was paying you for this code, um, I'm sure you'd become really rich because there's a lot of lines yeah. here involved. Um, if I look at this code, I kind of really have to decrypt your logic a little bit, so it's not immediately obvious to me what's going on and this null checking feels like it's probably quite something quite common here so is there maybe an alternative pattern that simplifies things for us a little bit 
Absolutely. There's uh, a nice factory method introduced in Java 9 called stream of nullable uh, that takes a value. And if it's null, it returns an empty stream. And if it's a value, it'll return the stream of that value. So we can say stream of nullable system dot get property part in the name close the brackets put the dot in and find first and we get the optional slash home slash richard back so it's on the same thing but my goodness is that uh, so much simpler than we than we'd see the old java 8 version definitely so that's definitely thumbs up for java 9 here awesome so uh, i'm going to hand over to you for a second and you are going to teach me something about Java 9. It's your turn. Fantastic. I definitely would love to teach you a, a few things, Richard. Uh, awesome. Can you confirm you can see my, my shell? I can. I can see J shell, and I can see payments by value. So well, what are we going to talk money. about here? Well, we're going to talk money, Richard. We've got some uh, different payments. So, you know, we, we've been working quite hard. Uh, and yeah. we're kind of buying a bunch of stuff at the same time, right? So here's a list of payments. Okay. So Fair enough. What, what, what may we want to do with uh, those this payments, Richard? Uh, how about we try and find payments that are below a certain value, or, or say the big payments? All right. Well, um, why don't we um, use a bit of the stream API here? So we've got a, a collection of elements here. We'll stream it. We'll filter uh yeah. the elements here uh and we're going to ensure that the values are greater or equal than 500 pounds fair enough and then collect them to a list fantastic and we've got obviously those three results as you can see 900 700 500 what do you think awesome I think that's good, but um, let's for a moment suppose that your business is expanding and you're making lots and lots and lots of payments and you just want to have a report that looks for those payments that are over 500. Now, if you were doing this on something like a database and it was a common query in your report, the database, you might be able to tell, look, just we're going to be doing lots of queries here. It'll build an index. It'll, look things, it'll hold things in sort order to begin with. So can we do that with the streams API? Uh, it's a very good point here. We, we know um, we can make use of the idea that the source is ordered here by by values. Uh, yeah. So filter is a bit expensive because it's analogous to doing a, a full scan. If we're talking database language here, so we have to kind of scan the whole collection to see if the elements are greater or not than five hundred. But because it's sorted, we can use a different operation, Richard. That was added in Java nine, and it's called take while. Now, right. take while um, takes the same predicate uh, as filter, but importantly, what it's going to do is to make use of short circuiting. So, as soon as it sees that predicate evaluates to false, then it stops any further computation. So that's really handy here because you know it can save some uh, computation time. So we've used take while here in the context of a collection that's sorted. Um, what about if it's unsorted? Can I, for example, take while and check a flag from, say, another thread, and then take until that flag is folding false? Um, I would not necessarily recommend you, you, you do that, uh, Richard, um, especially with lambdas and flags. It uh, doesn't really uh, work well together. So uh, even though the scenario described could, could be implemented, uh, it's not something I'd recommend. Okay. So have you got any thoughts on where you would use take while? So take while is, uh, for example, you might be streaming elements uh, from some, some source. And then at this point, this is where you can use short circuiting using this operation. Fantastic. So, so what about the other way around? Suppose the predicate was uh, false for a bunch of predicate, for a bunch of values, and then true from some point onwards. Is there like a, an analog here for that alternative case? Great question. Great question. So, um, you know, when we talk about splitting data, often we refer to kind of the, the head or the tail, or we talk about a tuple. There's the first part of the tuple, the left side and the right side. Now, you can achieve something very similar by using this operation called a drop while, which essentially gives you the second half of that data. Awesome. Awesome. So it just gives you the tail when it, when it goes false. Indeed. So really complementary operations. 
Cool, cool. So we've seen take while, we've seen drop while. Have there been any other stream changes in uh, Java 9? Well, there's a couple of, um, uh, one addition I was made to the factory method iterate, which you may be familiar with because it lets kind of build up a, a list of value given a generator or a supplier. So, awesome. um, you know, if I run this piece of code here, you know, which is going to generate a bunch of numbers and we see they get printed out on the screen and fantastic. Um, okay. So, so that stream stopped there. Why did it stop? Uh, so on my Mac, I press Control C, which gives a signal to stop the program. Uh, ah, very yeah. sneaky. Sneaky. So if you hadn't done that, what would have happened? So every time you say sneaky, I think PHP, which is bad, bad. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if if I didn't do that, as you can see, it just goes on forever. Oh, that's not so good. Is that's it? not very good. Um, but you're in luck, Richard. Um, you know, okay. um, what we get here is an infinite stream. And you can truncate the size of an infinite stream by using the operation called limit. Oh, I see. That's cool. So uh, just 0 to 9, the first 10 elements. But limit there is on the uh, number of elements that you've seen in the sequence, isn't it? It's not based upon the value. So how could I say, um, maybe if we can make it plus 2 instead of plus 1. And how can I get values which are under 10? Well, what about using filter to apply a predicate? All right. I uh, see the program here is not terminating. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Pretty bad. So, uh, uh, and you have to control C it again there, right? That's right. That's right. So um, something really interesting is, is happening under the hood here. Um, because we have a, a source for the stream that is infinitely calculating values, that predicate from filter is also infinitely being applied. So the program. Mm. Even though there's only uh, five values that are selected, 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, the, the stream here is still calculating values even though they're, they're not selected by the predicate. So it's kind of a weird scenario here. Awesome. Well, actually, that's the exact opposite of awesome. So is there a way we can solve this problem? I mean, some other programming languages have like a generator construct, don't they? Like Haskell does. Uh, Python does. So we can say, look, here's the predicate to terminate the, the iteration on. Yes, um, those are awesome features. Well, in, in Java 9, since they introduced take while, we could use take while to make use of the short circuiting property that we learned uh, just okay. a few minutes ago. Um, but like you're saying, uh, it'd be quite nice to have a little syntax uh, around this. So in, in Java, there is now um, an overload for um, each rate, which takes a, a yeah, nice, that takes a argument. Break which is a predicate. So now we can say n and plus two here, and then we can uh, print that stuff on the screen. There you go. Awesome, awesome, lovely stuff, lovely stuff. So that's pretty cool. So as you said, this is a bit more like those kind of generator constructs you see in things like Haskell and Python, and are really, really useful if you want like a, a sequence of values. Indeed. So um, let's uh, see what's next, Richard. Um, so we've covered streams. Yeah. So how about collectors? Uh, Are there some new collectors in Java 9? Yeah, so collectors. Also one of my favorite uh, updates to Java 8. So it really goes hands in hands with the stream API. And it's a way to uh, aggregate a stream in data structure a bit more fancy than just a list. For example, you could return a map. You could do some grouping. You could return uh, nested maps of sets, so quite a rich uh, API. So let's maybe have a quick uh, refresher, just to make sure everyone is, is on the same page with what collectors let you do. So um, Richard, I've got a list of your expenses here. Yeah. Um, I can see that expenses. you enjoy spending money on entertainment. How do you get these? Uh, I had a chat with you. Is your this content. from the Equifax leak? <laughs> is that how you got it? Uh, <laughs> Man, those Aquifax people need more than they let on. Okay, so I've got a bunch of expenses there. Well, uh, how about we try and find expenses that are related to uh, a year? I was going to so make things another. Point. I was going to make another Hello? PHP related joke, but I don't think it's quite appropriate in this context. Um, All right. <laughs> 
there's always time for. Well, that's a great question, Richard. So let's uh, let's use the stream API to solve that problem. Um, so you said you want to group based on the year. Is that correct? Yeah. How about that? There you go. Um, so here's kind of a map that's generated that for each year gives you a list of associated expenses. Uh, we may wish to do something a bit more fancy so those collectors here can be composed with what we call a downstream collector. So for example, here I can say calculate uh, the sum of the expenses amount per year. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, that sounds good. That sounds good. Um, so how about we do something like, you know, look at look at it's really expensive. Uh, so I only really care about expenses. They're over a thousand pounds. Okay. Um, um, well, and perhaps we can try and find expenses that are over a thousand pounds. That sounds like a, a useful uh, query. I suspect it's going to be entertainment, knowing you. But uh, let's let's have a go at this. Uh, so you want it's always expenses? It's always money. It's always money for it. So. Um, we're going to use filter, Richard. That's the, our good old filter friend that lets you apply a predicate. Uh, yeah, also. And then group by the year, make sure we get our pencils right, and there you go. And then we can compare so the results. In, in 2016, I just had a really big utility bill. I must have had a gas leak or something that year. Um, but in 2015, what happened? I mean, there's no entry in the map. Does that mean that I didn't have any expenses that were over a thousand pounds, or does that just mean that it didn't happen for me? Did I just skip it? Was I sleeping that whole year? Maybe you were drinking a little too much, Richard. Um, oh dear! Oh dear! Especially years. it happens to all of us. Um, but uh, the real reason, uh, Richard, I suspect, is not uh, because we we both enjoy having a drink or two. It's uh, because the filter operation is applied on the source and will filter out um, any elements that is um, smaller than a thousand. So that means that the year 2015 never makes it uh, through the collector, and that's why it's completely ignored by that time. I see, I see. That's a bit rubbish if you want to build a report up on this kind of stuff, isn't it? Because you, you do see, well, still want to see like the year 2015 in your report. You just want to know there's, it's empty and there's that meet that criteria rather than it just being missing. That, that's a great point, but don't worry, Richard. Uh, Javanine to the rescue. Javanine supports a collector called filtering that uh, will do the selection at the collector level rather than uh, the stream level. So if we use filtering instead and take the same predicate, then what you'll see is that the generated map here has both the year 2016 and also 2015. I'm pretty impressed with how you got the right number of brackets there. That is awesome. I was going to say... Um, uh, yeah, 2015, uh, empty. Nothing, correct. no expensive expenses in 2015. Cool, that, cool, that works. That works. Excellent. Um, um, let's let's uh, spin it in a different direction, Richard. I want to find out yeah. about kind of uh, the different tags that okay. uh, you take. Use quite quite frequently, so I just want to extract what? them quite simply. If you want to extract something from a value with a stream tape, you can just call map, can't you? You can just say t map out tags from a from an expense, right? Yeah, something like that. So for each element, let's just pull out the tags. Uh oh, hmm, that doesn't really look right, does it? You've got like we've got food, entertainment, utility, travel, entertainment. Hmm. Um, They're kind of like a list with lists in them, aren't they? Yeah, uh, well, the I have flat, one by one. I had a flat map as a solution. Why don't we just use flat map? Flat map uh -oh. is the solution to all of life's problems. Uh, but in this case, flat map needs to have a value that's returned that takes a stream, and the value that get tags returning is returning a list. Indeed. So let's uh, fix that. And. Uh, We'd love to just say a, a colon colon stream, won't we? But obviously that's not uh, possible as a language feature. So we will take our um, expense and then we'll get the tags. And because we need to return a stream here, because that's what a flat map takes as an argument, then 
here we get a list of tags, and maybe we want a unique one so we could collect to a set. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Utility, food, travel, entertainment. That sounds about right. Perfect. Living the good life. Yeah. Uh, so earlier we had this cart. We had uh, reports where we were collecting things by year. Can we combine the collecting by year with the tags? Yeah. So uh, let's um, group by year. Then uh, why don't we use the collector mapping, which will extract the tags. Um, and we'll put that into a set. set. And then, as you say, let's get our brackets right because we love Lisp. Um, <laughs> and oh, uh, that doesn't seem right, does it? Well, in one sense, it seems right because in 2015, I had no utility bill and it was all travel and entertainment. So that must have been a good year. Uh, but in another sense, from a programming point of view, it's a bit wrong because we've got the same problem we had with map earlier, didn't we? And there's no flat mapping. Is there? Well, Richard, in Java 9, there is flat mapping. Awesome. So let's uh, change this piece of code here so that it returns uh, a stream because, as you may have guessed, uh, that's what flat mapping requires. Works just like it's uh, older brother, the flat map method. There you go. Even more pansies. Awesome. Cool. And here you are. Here Please. is the answer to your query. Amazing. Uh, I'm glad there's no... Maybe I just spent all of my... Maybe my utility bill for 2015 came in in 2016, and that's why I had a huge utility bill. Yeah, or maybe you, know, you, you got tired of traveling, so you decided to stay home a bit more, and that's why your utility bill is super high, and your food bill is also uh, very high. Mm. Fantastic. Interesting. So what's uh, what's uh, next? Um, Guys, can I interrupt you like just really quickly because it's a very on point question with with this. Uh, how would you go about sorting the output of, of a grouping by uh, collector? Uh, just say like you want to sort by the years uh, ascending or descending. I realize so, that it might be not Java 9 question, but uh, it would be way tougher to come back to this uh, moment in time later. Like something, do you wrap it into a tree map, or is there a way to provide the actual map type? Of yeah, so I think it's a fantastic question. There is um, a, a collector called to collection that lets you specify exactly which data structure uh, you want to build up the elements in, and that could well be a sorted uh, collection. Excellent. Yeah, Thank so you. that will that will get you a map. If you pick a tree map, then that will get you it's sorted by keys, which is probably what you want here. You probably want 2015 and 2016 by keys. Um, uh, I'm not sure if there's a nicer way of doing this, but uh, one way of doing it is you can use a collecting and then collector to just run an arbitrary uh, function on the collected values at the end, and then you could sort them. That's right, and you always have the um, a possibility of you know doing a sort later on too. Uh, you can do it with the collectors uh, if you build up directly into the collection, uh, but you can also do some post processing later. On. Absolutely. Great. So, um, Richard, um, I'm going to hand over to you to talk about the final topic for today, which is uh, optional. So let me uh, stop sharing and over to you. Cool. Yeah. So. Uh... Oh, I take it you can see my screen, yep. Yes, fantastic. Nice black and white, yeah. perfect. So let's talk about the optional uh, API for a little bit. So let's evolve our uh, properties domain and look at our, we've got a little lookup setting uh, by name. And what that will return is a domain object wrapped in an optional if it's present. So it'll be an optional of setting. For example, if we have uh, a missing value, like say our app home, uh, then it will return an empty. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the same kind of approach earlier, but this time work with it with the uh, setting .lookup setting my name method. So I've got my, my stream with my app home and my user home. There we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, map each of those things using the uh, lookup setting by name method. 
Then that will return me some optionals, and the optional is a wrapper that's either present or absent, depending upon whether you've got a value in there. So what we need to do here, first of all, is, is remove the things which are absent. So we want to do, say, optional is present. And, and then you're going to have to extract those values. So you, are you going to say optional, colon, colon, get? Yeah, so that's what we're going to do here. So there's a Java right approach. And then we can just find first at the end. And that gives us our optional with a setting object wrapped up in it and, and the value of my home directory. But Richard, come on. Come on, Richard. Like, this code feels quite smelly because on the first hand, we have to explicitly poke the state of this optional. And, and then after that, we need to actually pull the element out. It feels like those two steps here could probably be compacted into one single operation, can't it? Exactly. Um, and in Java 9, what we, the preferred way of taking those optionals and checking where they're present and then getting them in a stream situation, it's just a flat map the optional value into a stream, which a method has been added to support that, and then we can uh, find first at the end. So I think there's one, if there's one takeaway from a, a, a webinar, Richard, is that flat map is definitely cool in Java 8 and Java 9. Absolutely. So we, we've uh, got the, the, the optional.stream method. Another method I'd like to talk about is the if present or else method that's been added. And you know, it's something that I do, something you do a lot, is flying, right? Yes, um, which can be quite quite exhausting, to be honest. It's quite nice to be uh, in Cambridge uh, uh, a bit more. But uh, Richard, why don't we, uh, to help us out, why don't we write a little application that's going to manage our booking references for flights? Yeah, so I've, I'm, I'm going to take my booking reference, and I want to kind of check into my flight. So given a booking reference, the first thing people want to do is say, look up the booking. OK. And here, again, we're using the optional API to model the fact the booking may be present or it may be absent. So for example, if I've got a flight from London City Airport to JFK, that exists. Trying to fly from, say, Cardiff Airport to JFK, that doesn't exist. So we get an optional like empty bag. So what we've got, if we go back to our original uh, JFK, London City to JFK example, if, if say I want to display this booking, We've got our booking. I've got a couple of methods here I can call on my uh, UI class. One of them is display checking, and one of them is display missing booking page. So I can, for example, look at my booking, and I can say if that's present with Java 8, we'll unwrap the uh, value in question, and it will pass the value to the argument here. So it'll say uh, display checking uh, on the if present. And that says, look, I'm checking in London City JFK. Look at that UI, man. That's amazing. That's 2017 quality UX. Um, yeah, let, let's let's just go with with, with that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And if I say flip back to going from Cardiff to JFK, it'll display nothing because it's absent. What we want here is the ability to display our check-in page if it's there, or also, for example, redirect to the missing booking page if it's not there. So, right? Richard, it's almost like we'd like to say, if present, or else, do something else. It's almost like we want to say that, isn't it? Let's just write that code and see what happens. Boom, missing booking, perfect Amundo. So this is a method that was added in Java 9. Um, and if the value's there, it'll call the first argument. And if it's absent, it'll call the second function. So we'll get missing booking if we're going from Cardiff to JFK. And if I flip back up to go from London City to JFK, we'll get the checking in page. So we can see both the options being called there. What do you feel? I think this is great. I think this is a well-needed method that was missing in, in Java 8 because it's quite common to be wanting to provide a, a default action. So it's nice to have this uh, method around now. Absolutely, absolutely. And our final thing to do with optional, our final operation on optional is the or method. So if I've got a, a company here, and, uh, just, we're going to call their name a client for a moment. I've got a few different options. But all we want to be able to do is look at where those clients are. So we've got one kind of little database or kind of little address book. 
which are related to clients. So if we pass that in there, we've got a find client method, and that will return you an optional value and tell you where the address of this company is. So maybe we know who they are, we've got an address on file for them. Maybe we don't know who they are. So let's convert that over to be another company. And our find client method here will return empty. But we can still look up the company details from their name, okay? And that will return us, say, Cambridge, where this other company is. But even that may be empty. So suppose I've just hit my keyboard and gone Z, 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 Z. That will return empty because not every string is a company name, unbelievable. So what can we do here? Uh, to combine these things together. We want to kind of chain these things together. I want to say, look, find it if it's a client, and if it's not in our client address book, we'll look it up generally. What, what do you, what would you, what's your choice, Raul? How would we go about this? Um, well, you'd be tempted to say, find a client or do something else. So um, in, in Java 8, we've got this method called or else get, isn't it? Yep, and we can say, uh, look up company, company details as a backup, right? And what's going to go on here? Well, we see bad return type in Lambda expression, or else get is useful when you want to call a function that definitely returns a value, but in situations like this where the backup value may also return an optional, may also fail in some way, it doesn't really cut the mustard. We need to have another solution here. And that's where the or method comes into play. So in this case, our company is called Z, 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 so both of these fail. If we change it to be another company and rerun the code, it'll tell us the address in Cambridge. And if we go all the way, okay, look, if we uh, say the company called a client, you'll get their address to be in London. Fantastic, what do you feel, how do you feel? Happy? I think it's uh, definitely useful because chaining different uh, methods that may be returning an optional is something quite common, so it's nice to have a, a little method that kind of glues it together now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, that is the end of the different topics we've talked about. We talked about factory methods, we've talked about streams, we've talked about collectors, we've talked about the optional API as well, and there's a kind of common theme running through here, isn't there, Raoul? Yes, and uh, the common theme is, you know, Java 8 was great, uh, but Java 9 makes things just a little bit more polished, just a little bit more uh, practical and useful. Uh, so it's not just about, you know, the module system, there's also a ton of different little library updates that make you more productive on a day to day. Now, if you want to find out more about um, other library updates in Java 9, uh, do check out our website, so iteratorlearning.com. So iterator spelled with a D O because we are a hipster uh, group of people. Uh, and we also deliver Java training courses uh, in person at your company. So if you're interested in Java 8 or reactive programming or performance, then uh, do get in touch through our website or through uh, our Twitter and LinkedIn. So it's been a, a real pleasure, uh, Richard, to deliver this webinar with you. Thank you so much for the video for organizing it and putting together a great event with many fantastic talks. So thank you very much and see you guys soon. Oh, thank you so Fantastic. much for the nice words about the V-Drug. It's, 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 yeah. it's, it's, it has been great to host you here uh, as the normal virtual drug sessions as well. And this, this was one of the most entertaining sessions uh, here during those 12 that I noticed this, this, this V-Drug 24. Having a, a dual speaker is always a treat. So thank you so much, Richard. Thank you so much, Ro. Uh, let me check if oh, we have sure. any, any questions. So first, Anil Jug, uh, do you have any questions? You have the precedence over the Slack because you are participating uh, live. As, as you say, I think it was the most um, entertaining session. It's good to have yeah. interaction between the two persons that we, uh, we find uh, very good. So, uh, and then we have a lot of stuff to and uh, do some further investigations for the job and yeah. stuff. 
It was sometimes it was very quick quick because switching between Richard and uh, um, and and screen. That that's one small point. But for the, for the rest, great session. Thanks. Yeah. Anna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bet Edmond? <laughs> yeah, bet <Edmond. laughs> So thank you, guys. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, are there any questions on Slack? The feedback is taken in. That was my fault for not orchestrating the screen correctly. Totally me to blame. Uh, yeah, I don't see any questions on, on the Slack as well. Just more praise about how awesome the presentation was and more clapping emojis. Oh, fantastic. That's lovely. Uh, yeah, well, thanks I a guess, lot. I, I guess it's, it's it's been an awesome session. Everyone understood everything, and there are there are no questions. Joe nine, Joe nine, Joe nine, Joe nine. Like so, I have a question because uh, I've been inspecting those uh, core Java updates. Out of those minor features, so each one of you, please, out of the minor features that you didn't cover, uh, the core API updates, right? Oh, or what are your favorite minor features in the Java 9 update? Like you, you covered streams, optionals, right? You covered uh, some money. Uh, there, is, there is more. I'm going to jump in uh, on this one so that Richard cannot steal my answer. Uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a couple of updates that were introduced to completable future, uh, including an asynchronous timeout. Uh, which I think is a nice little touch uh, to have because uh, I enjoy using completable future um, as a way to compose these synchronous computations together. And that was a, a missing little update to the completable future API. So quite happy with it. Your turn, Richard. Yeah. Uh, do you mean, sorry, do you mean all like out of things we talked about today or things that we didn't talk about? Out of the things you didn't talk about today didn't talk about what what I've done before which has always been a real pain in the neck in Java but actually if you see we've actually got an article on it on our website on iteratorlearning.com is the process API that was added to Java 9 there's a new process API there um, which was done by uh, Roger Riggs who's uh, a great guy um, and uh, I'm sure there are other people helping him as well I know he was leading that project and also kindly reviewed this article as well, which was very, very nice of him. Um, and basically dealing with processes is a thing that we do more and more these days as more and more development is related to infrastructure and making sure operations are working and initiating and choreographing and orchestrating. And it's always been quite bad in Java previously, but the, the process API in Java 9 adds lots and lots of useful things. Previously, the, the best way of getting the process ID of a JVM that you were in was to call the management factory dot get runtime MX bean and then parse the identifier out of a string returned by this runtime MX bean. Ridiculous if you do anything to do with process operations. Uh, whereas this was uh, a really good API. So that's, that's something um, I'm really looking forward to being able to use in the future. Okay. Wonderful. That's actually a really great answers. Uh, not surprisingly, though, but actually great answers. Excellent. Thank you so much, guys. We are going to head into a short pause. And then at the start of the new hour, we are going to continue with the next session. Uh, and the next session is going to be, uh, let me just figure it out. So while I'm figuring that out, thanks again, Richard. Thanks again, Raul. It was excellent to see you again. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, See you guys. Have a good video 24 and don't pass out. Yeah, we, we, we have shifts. <laughs> so uh, hopefully uh, we got it covered. Bye. Bye. So Enelgeok, you're welcome to stay uh, for the next session if you, if you would like. I think we have space in the Hangouts callers. So if you're not going, then uh, cool. we'll see you again. Uh, if you want to go, uh, thank you. It was great seeing you here. Thanks for participating and supporting uh, Virtual Jock 24.